Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 23rd ECS and Cloud Feedback Virtual Symposium. It's great that you could join us. Um, we have three really great speakers today, and they're going to each be giving talks of about 12 minutes. Uh, there'll be some time for questions after each talk, and then if there's time at the end, we'll have a short general Q&A. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, type them into the chat at any time. Uh, if you'd rather ask your questions in person or your own voice, then you can just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. If you uh, have an idea for a talk you'd like to give in the future, please reach out to anyone on our executive committee. You can find our contact information, uh, videos of past talks, information about signing up, signing up for the mailing list, and a whole lot more at our website. It's here. Um, just as a heads up, our mailing list is in the middle of a transition over to uh, being a Google group. So uh, I think half of the people uh, on the mailing list have been moved over by this point. Uh, I think by the next event, we should be fully over there. So don't be surprised if you see an email from us uh, about that. And just, I'm gonna give a heads up now that our next event is a little bit earlier in the month than usual. It's gonna be on Monday, uh, the 17th. So uh, that's just uh, the notes to start. Um, our first speaker is going to be Andrew Williams. Andrew, mind if you start to uh, set up your uh, slides, but uh, Andrew is a PhD student at the uh, Atmospheric, Oceanic and Planetary a physics department at the University of Oxford. And uh, take it away, Andrew. Right, cheers. Thanks, Jonah. Um, no way to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm um, happy to be here today. Thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, just a quick shout out to Jonah, actually, and to Nadia Chibanji at to GFDL as well for being like my co authors on this work and being very great fun to work with if you ever get a chance to work with them. Um, so, anyway, this work is really motivated generally by the concept of the SST pattern effect which I'm assuming most people here are gonna be kind of at least um, vaguely familiar with, but for those who don't, it's, it's basically this idea that your uh, energy balance at the top of the atmosphere or perturbations to it depend on the spatial pattern of SST anomalies. So if you have a given SST anomaly, say a warming or a cooling, um, your resultant change in TOA balance depends on where you put that warming or cooling. Um, and for the, in the case of the tropics, we can understand this with a kind of very simple conceptual model, kind of tropical climate dynamics 101. Um, uh, so what I've plotted here is uh, uh, SSTs in the Pacific Basin. So this is kind of, you get uh, warm SSTs in the Western Pacific, colder SSTs in the Eastern Pacific, and then this kind of cold tongue. Over the warmest SSTs, you get deep convection, and deep convection puts the, makes the temperature profile locally be a moist, moist adiabat. And then because of the weak temperature gradient constraint, Gravity waves uh, are very efficient at homogenizing this temperature profile across the tropics. So this temp moist adiabatic temperature profile gets approximately imprinted across the tropics, even over regions where you have these very cold boundary layers. Um, and as a result, you get these structures which look like this, which are called inversions. They kind of promote the proper the, the um, formation of low clouds in these regions, which are very strong, have very strong control on the TOA, ba the TOA balance. So if we take this kind of conceptual model and we quote unquote warm in a region of uh, strong inversions, then what you can see is that warming just weakens the inversion because you don't affect the free tropospheric temperature, but you ra raise the temperature of the boundary layer. And as a result, you have a weaker inversion, fewer low clouds, and this is a positive TOA response, which is primarily local. On the other hand, if you take this exact same warming blob, but you put in the Western Pacific, what you get is your warming is communicated uh, vert vertically by the deep convection throughout the whole atmospheric column. And then this warmer moist adiabat gets communicated across the tropics and you set up stronger inversions. Um, and this gives you more low clouds generally, and that's a negative TOA response. So depending on where, on the specific pattern of warming that you have, this can change the sign and just all the dynamics of what's happening to your TOA. So that's why the pattern effect is important and some of its basic kind of intuitive physics. But we wanna be a little bit more quantitative than this. We don't just wanna have pretty pictures. Um, and one way that people have gone about trying to do this is by using so-called uh, SST greens functions. Um, and the basic idea behind it is you can take these kind of SST perturbations and you can run them in an atmosphere only model. And rather than running them, uh, rather than running just one, you can run hundreds of these things. 
So this is a nice schematic from Wei Dong's paper where they took a CAM, one of the CAM models, um, and they basically ran it uh, hundreds of times, putting one of these SST perturbations in different locations across the globe. Each dot tells you the center of that perturbation. And once you've done all those experiments, you can calculate the change in global mean TOA balance relative to some control that happened in each of these experiments. And you can use that to generate some kind of sensitivity map or a greens function um, for what is the change in global mean TOA uh, flux but, uh, as a result of a change in SST at a given grid point. So what this map is telling you is that the greens function predicts that when you warm in the Western Pacific region of lots of convection, you get uh, negative changes in global mean TOA, which is consistent with what, I, what we just showed, um, saw in the conceptual model, versus when you warm in the Eastern Pacific, you get a positive influence on the TOA, which is, again, consistent. Um, this is great. We've learned a lot from these kind of methods, but there's a kind of, um, kind of thing that often gets swept under the rug with these kind of approaches. And the problem is that Green's functions are a fundamentally kind of linear thing. When you learn them in your undergraduate, you're told that if your problem's linear, you can think about with Green's functions. And so effectively, what, uh, what uh, you assume when you do a Green's function kind of reconstruction of TOA or something like this, is you're assuming that your relationship between global mean TOA flux and local SSTs looks something like this. So for example, in the Western Pacific, when you warm, you get a negative TOA flux, negative change in your TOA, and the Green's function kind of assumes that that just generates, you know, that's just a perfect line like this. So you can propagate that back to negative SSTs as well. But in reality, it could look very different. The real world could be much more complicated than this. Uh, it could be relatively insensitive to SSTs over a large like range of this phase space. Um, it could saturate on one side and you know, lots of other things. Um, and a priori, it's not clear which one of these is correct. Um, and that's really important for understanding the validity of Green's function pro approaches and where, you know, where we should trust them and not trust them. So what we did to kind of make some progress here is we took the ICON model, which is just a GCM. We ran it in atmosphere only mode forced by climatological SSTs and sea ice. And then on top of that, we ran a series of experiments where we perturb the SSTs with kind of patches like this uh, in, in individually in different locations, spanning all the way from a region of deep convection to a region of more shallow convection. And then we used uh, different SST perturbation strengths all the way from plus or minus 1K to plus or minus 4K. And then I've plotted here the change in global mean TOA flux as a function of all of these. And the first thing to take away is it's really complicated and that it's not linear. So you can't take the results from your plus 3K or plus 2K experiment and use them to recreate what's happening when you put a minus 2K or 3K perturbation in. Uh, so that's the first thing to take away. Um, the second, to get a bit more uh, detailed and for the sake of time, we're just gonna focus on the Western Pacific patch. This is just a region of deep convection. And what you see straight away is that when you warm in this region, you get a negative change in your TOA flux, which we expect from making more strengthening inversions, more low clouds, like I showed. Uh, and, and this kind of increases kind of quasi-linearly with your forcing strength. How, and then when you cool in this region, you get a slightly positive change in your TOA. So it's kind of linear over a small region of this, of this parameter space, but then it very quickly saturates. Um, and eventually you're even putting in like kind of minus 4K perturbations here and you're not really affecting the, TO, the global mean TOA anymore. So we wanna understand why this is happening. And to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna recast our kind of simple conceptual picture that I showed earlier uh, in terms of the moist static energy. So the moist static energy, which I'll call H or MSE in this talk is uh, it's quite a simple quantity. It's just the sum of temperature, specific humidity and uh, height all in energy units. And it's useful because it's a conserved quantity during moist adiabatic processes. For example, uh, in the presence of moist deep convection with precipitates. Uh, and as a result of this conservation, this means that in the presence of deep convection, the moist static energy in the boundary layer, which we term H0, is approximately equal to the saturation moist static energy of the free troposphere, uh, which we give a H star FT here. And this is kind of termed the convective quasi-equilibrium hypothesis or some version of that for those that are interested. Um, but a simpler way of thinking about it, which is fine for this talk, is basically that in, the, in regions of deep convection, what deep convection is basically doing is it's taking the subcloud values, the boundary layer values of the moist static energy, and it's kind of homogenizing them throughout the column. So um, with this in mind, 
we can now begin to think of the tropical atmosphere as a circus tent. Now, bear with me here. This is where I begin to, people start to roll their eyes and glaze over a bit. Um, so this is a circus tent here. And it basically what it is, you've got three ingredients. You have a tight fabric here, um, which is very, you know, kind of uh, yeah, tight and taut. You have poles in different locations and they can be different heights as well. Um, and when the pole is, and then the pole can be in contact with this fabric and it kind of pushes it up. Now, uh, if, in, if we interpret this tight fabric as being the, the moist static energy of the free troposphere, the poles as being these centers, regions of deep convection, intense deep convection, and the heights of these poles as being the kind of boundary layer of moist static energy in these regions, then we can draw a picture which looks a little bit like this. Um, and this is our kind of new, ver new conceptual model that we'll think in terms of now. So what I've drawn is just a, a, a transect from some warm SSTs to some cold SSTs. And then you go from high subcloud moist static energy to low subcloud moist static energy. Um, and what this is saying is that um, in regions of deep convection, you have high subcloud moist static energy, so a high tent pole that's in contact with this tent fabric because they have the and the val and the height of these things is kind of telling you. So that the fact that sorry, the fact that um, mo uh, deep convection homogenizes this moist static energy in the vertical is basically telling you that the tent pole and the tent fabric have to be in contact. So when you have another way of saying this is just when you have deep convection, it's like a tent pole that's pushing up the tent fabric. So then it gets some height. And then because of weak temperature gradient arguments, this thing doesn't just fall off straight away, but it kind of gets approximately imprinted across the whole of the tropics. And then you set up these kind of inversion structures here. And in this model, again, the height of the tent of this pole is telling you um, the height of the moist static energy in, the, in these regions of cold SSTs, relatively low. And the difference between the height of the tent pole and the tent fabric gives you a measure of inversion strength. So this is kind of equivalent to this picture I showed earlier, but a little bit more robust. Now we can take this, this picture and we can think, okay, what happens if we warm in a region of, of convection like this Western tropical Pacific? So if we warm in a convective region, what we're basically doing is you're taking a tent pole that's already in contact with this tent fabric and you're just pushing it up. And as a result, you raise the moist static energy of the free troposphere across the whole tropics through so these weak temperature gradient arguments. Then that means you set up stronger inversions throughout across the tropics. Uh, you get more low clouds, and that's a negative TOA response, as we saw earlier. And again, there's no upper and there's no upper limit here. You can, at least intuitively, you can just keep punching, punching, punching up into that tent fabric, and it'll just keep going. Now, on the other hand, if you cool in a convective region, you take a tent pole effectively, which is already in contact with this fabric and you bring it down. And through tension that kind of releases the, that kind of lowers the fabric across the whole of the pre troposphere That's one way of thinking about it. So when you cool in a convective region, initially you get weaker inversions and then uh, fewer low clouds and a positive TOA response, got my signs mixed up. Um, now, if you continue to cool in a convective region, eventually, your tent pole, because it's shrinking and shrinking, eventually it just gets out of contact with this tent fabric. And then in reality, what's happening here is you're just shutting down deep convection. Um, the boundary layer has now become disconnected effectively from the free troposphere. And so it can cool as much as it wants and it won't affect the inversions anymore and therefore won't really affect the TOA through these low cloud changes. And that should sound familiar because that is what we find in our GCM experiments. You kind of have no upper limit on the uh, through this pathway, where you can keep just punching up and ra raising the moist static energy of the free troposphere, you can lower the moist static energy of the free troposphere a bit by reduce by cooling and shutting off convection. But once you shut off convection, it's kind of nothing else you can do, um, and so you begin to asymptote. So yeah, we have some conclusions. Um, the, some the pattern effect is important, and there are some methods uh, around for quantifying it, but these kind of implicitly assume linearity. Um, and then we looked at it in, a, in our model. It turns out nonlinearity non is kind of a ubiquitous feature of the tropics. And also we argue a fairly fundamental feature of the tropics, particularly this asymmetry between positive and negative SST perturbations. Um, and you can understand it intuitively by thinking of the tropical atmosphere as a circus tent. And this was recently published all in the GRL uh, if you want to have some more gory details. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to find my mouse. Um, <laughs> I thought I just gave my stuff. Okay. <laughs>
So if you have any questions, either raise your hand uh, and we'll unmute you or uh, type them in the chat and I will read them out. So while people are typing or thinking about questions, I, I have one. Um, so is it fair to say that this means that um, TOA radiation is going to be particularly sensitive to the regions of strongest deep convection or the regions of highest subcloud MSC. Um, and then could you get something that's more linear by, instead of looking in geographic space, looking in like omega 500 space, like a bony decomposition or in H subcloud space? Yeah, so both, both good questions. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, I think the main reason that you get the strongest TOA response in these regions of deep convection is because they're able to set off these non-local impacts through changing the inversion, basically. So I guess, yeah, effectively that, that, yeah, you would, this is kind of, but this is kind of known already, I think that, right, if you get, they have, you have basically the strongest control of TOA are from tropical SST changes in regions of deep convection um, because of that, these changes, non-local changes to the inversion. I think that's that's fine. The other question was, do you get the same nonlinearities if you think in a different in a different kind of phase space? I think you do. Um, I think the point because the point is that uh, you can think about this uh, in terms of say omega five hundred greater than zero, you get deep convection. Less than zero, you get you don't you shut off deep convection. This the nonlinearity is still there. You just kind of you know it's it's what then the question becomes what's controlling your omega five hundred. And at least we would argue it's it's your buoyancy, which is controlled by the difference between the moist static energy of the free troposphere and the, the boundary layer. Um, so I think that it's still there, um, but I, I mean, there might be some way of, I don't know, I, 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 have the, I have a feeling that it would still be there, kind of you couldn't get rid of it, but I'm, maybe someone has a better idea. Cool, no, thanks. Uh, okay, Karsten. Yeah. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, great talk. It does remind me of your cloud uh, talk that went viral. <laughs> the Oxford Uni. Everyone who hasn't watched it, just Google it. It's great uh, to watch. Um, yeah, no, really well done. I also wonder, is it that circus tents always have like free poles? That was news to me. <laughs> but apart from that, uh, it's it's a great explanation. I would have asked some things along similar uh, lines of uh, Paolo, whether there is some observational evidence to back that up. And also real quick is, so you did it in, in an AMIP experiment. Would it change if you did it in a CMIP uh, with all the trouble, obviously, that comes with doing it in a fully coupled run? Yeah. Um, I mean, so... I guess the observation, I haven't seen the chat, but yeah, the observational question is a good one. Um, there has been some, there's work in the ENSO literature, which kind of echoes a lot of this. So um, Nat Johnson and a few others have shown, kind of shown if you, if you, if you um, kind of just scatter um, your Nino 3.4 index against o, your OLR or your precipitation average against in that region, it's also nonlinear. There's kind of some regime where your SSTs set off deep convection, and then once it's shut down, you know nothing really changes anymore. So there is, um, at least locally, this this idea, this threshold behavior of deep convection where it can just shut on and shut off is fairly well documented. The new thing here is linking that to the TOA because of these changes in inversions. Basically, um, I guess it's tricky to link these to these particular um, runs to observations. Because our observations are over a period where we have two regions changing, the West Pacific going up and the, you know, the, the, the East Pacific cooling. So in this picture, we've kind of over the historical period had the tent pole that's in contact with the fabric going up and all these other small tent poles going down. So we have kind of two impacts on the inversion uh, structure, basically. Um, and would it be different in a coupled model? I guess. Uh, yeah, generally. So I mean, if you if you if you warm in a convective region, you strengthen the Walker circulation, then that's neg negative feedbacks on your initial change. So yes, I think so. Um, but I mean, yeah, I get yeah. So I think it would be different. You have to think about exactly how. But yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Great. Awesome. Um, 
we have to move on in the interest of time, but as usual, please continue the conversation in the chat. Uh, and Andrew, there's a couple of questions uh, in the chat that you might want to address. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. Um, our next speaker is Margaret Duffy. Uh, Margaret is a postdoctoral fellow at the National Center for Atmospheric Science. And I think Margaret's better talk up, so take it away. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me, see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, I'm Margaret Duffy. I'm a postdoc at NCAR. Um, and this is work that I've done with Brian Medeiros, Andrew Gettleman, and Trude Eidhammer. And then I'm going to be talking about the role of uh, parameters on cloud feedbacks, uh, particularly in the NCAR model. Um, okay, so I want to just introduce this um, by showing you a very familiar figure um, from Zelinka et al. 2020. Um, and I have just three things that I want you to hold in your heads as I'm talking, and those three things are written on the top of the slide. Um, so uh, again, I, as I mentioned, I'm focusing on kind of uh, the, the uh, cloud feedbacks and models. And so I thought I would just show you what's going on in, in model land. Um, as I think you probably all know, the CMIP5 model ECS and CMIP6 model ECS shown in blue and orange here in panel A, um, we've seen an increase in the spread. Uh, in ECS from CMIP5 to CMIP6. Um, and what I've added here are stars um, representing uh, the ECS in the uh, NCAR model and various generations of the NCAR model. So CCSM4 uh, is the oldest of the three that I'm showing here. CESM2 is the newest. And so we can see that over time, uh, the ECS in the NCAR model has increased quite a bit. Um, and the final point that I want to make here, looking over here at panel C, is that if we look at the feedbacks corresponding to this ECS, that the spread in the cloud feedback uh, is the greatest of, of the five feedbacks uh, shown here. And so for that reason, we focus um, on cloud feedbacks in particular. Um, okay, so I mentioned we'd be focusing on cloud feedbacks, and we're going to be focusing on the role of parameters. Uh, model parameters on the cloud feedback. And the reason why we do this is that um, in climate models, as I think you all realize, um, uh, uh, clouds are uh, subgrid. And so there are a lot of kind of parameterized processes uh, that are influencing the clouds. And so we're going to focus on the role of parameters um, on convection, cloud microphysics, aerosols, and turbulence, and how those then go on to influence uh, the cloud feedback. Um, and just a little bit more specifically to give you detail about what we're doing here, we're going to use a perturbed parameter ensemble or PPE. Um, and that is an ensemble of 262 simulations run with CAM6. That's the community atmosphere model version six. That's the atmosphere model that's in CESM2, that high climate sensitivity model. Um, and what differs across these 262 simulations is uh, the 45 different atmospheric model parameters from the schemes that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, these simulations are atmosphere only, so they have imposed um, SSTs um, and they're short, they're three years each, which enables us to run uh, several of these simulations. And then for each simulation, we're gonna use two experiments here, a present day and then a 4K warming. And the difference between those two is how we're calculating the feedback. Um, but I just want to make one more note here about how um, the parameter ranges are selected for each of these 45 parameter uh, parameters that are varied. Um, they are uh, intended to kind of be within physical process limits right, um, according to expert assessment. Um, but of course, we're actually varying the parameters simultaneously across the 262 simulations. And so this can yield uh, some unrealistic looking climates. And so we just whittle this down to 206 um, based on top of atmosphere radiative imbalance. Um, so hopefully that's clear. We have an ensemble of 206 simulations with uh, 45 atmospheric model parameters varying across the simulations. Um, okay, so let's actually look at what's happening in those simulations. Um, uh, each of the 260, sorry, 206 simulations uh, has a blue dot here uh, for the cloud feedback. We have a default simulation, which uses uh, the same model parameters uh, that are kind of the default model parameters uh, uh, that are used in CESM2. Uh, and we can compare uh, what's going on in the PPE in blue um, to what's going on in the CMIP6 models 
in yellow. Um, and a couple of things jumped out at me about this. And so um, here are kind of my, my questions uh, for today. One, um, this default simulation, the, the circle, uh, has a lower cloud feedback uh, than CESM2, the square. That was a surprise to us. Um, and so I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, the other thing that jumped out at us is that this spread in the cloud feedback um, across the PPE is very similar to the spread across CMIP6 models. Um, so this is telling us um, that this spread across CMIP6 models, which of course differ in, uh, very greatly from one another, can be reproduced by just changing parameters. And so we want to know whether that's a coincidence or whether that's the result of the same underlying processes. Um, we also want to know which parameters are setting this spread. Um, and given this very large sensitivity to parameters, we want to know whether um, the increase in ECS that we saw across generations of the NCAR model um, is due to changes in parameters. Um, I realize this is kind of an ambitious agenda, so I'm going to focus on one and two today, but I wanted to bring your attention to three and four uh, so that you know uh, that I'm interested in this and that uh, we uh, that we can chat about this um, if you're interested too. Uh, so let me get started on that first question. So again, that's why is the cloud feedback in the PPE default simulation lower than the feedback uh, in CESM2? Um, and so we can see that here. So CESM2 is the star and the PPE default is the circle. Um, and this is a really important question because um, the feedback is much lower and this corresponded to an ECS of over five Kelvin and all else equal, this would correspond um, to an ECS of more like 3K. So why uh, the difference? Well, first of all, the CMIP models are of course fully coupled. Um, and uh, this is a these are four times CO2 experiments that are run for quite a long time whereas the PPE is an atmosphere only model. Um, and so I just put the AMIT models on here for a more fair comparison. And I put um, in this square CESM2, but the AMIT version, and we can see that that kind of splits the difference. Um, so a lot of this difference is explained um, basically by, by coupling um, and the fact uh, that this CMIP uh, model has this kind of dynamic ocean and a four times CO2, whereas we're just uh, looking at uniform 4K warming, uh, no dynamic ocean. Uh, this is not entirely surprising given the pattern effect, um, which you uh, just heard about uh, in the last talk, which was really nice. Um, so the CMIP models are able to capture the pattern effect, whereas the AMIP and PPE cannot really capture that. Uh, so that's not so much of a surprise, but there's still a difference here. And that is what really surprised us. Uh, we weren't expecting this. And in the end, it came down to version, model version. Uh, so I've done, I've put a, a black triangle on here so that we can compare um, apples to apples, um, what's going on with model version. So the CMIP and AMIP models are run with an early version, CAM 6.0. The PPE was run more recently with CAM 6.3. And if we make an apples to apples comparison between CAM 6.0, the triangle, and CAM 6.3, the circle, we can see that the cloud feedback has decreased. So as people have gone in and fiddled with the model, made these kind of run of the mill changes, um, we have seen the cloud feedback go down. Uh, so that was a surprise to us, but I think pretty interesting and something to keep in mind um, as we're analyzing the PPE. So let's move on to that second question, which was about the spread now in the feedbacks. Um, and so I, I wanted to know whether um, it was a coincidence uh, that we were getting similar spread across the PPE as the CMET models, um, or, or whether they were set, uh, the spreads are set by the same processes. And so I do that by decomposing the total cloud feedback um, into um, various processes. Um, and so I'm actually going to start um, by just decomposing the cloud feedback into its shortwave and longwave contributions. And then I'm going to do a little bit more in-depth uh, decomposition into these six assess feedback components uh, that um, I think many of you probably know about from the Sherwood assessment. Um, and so this figure is borrowed from Sherwood. Here we can see the total feedback and its six um, contributions uh, from these processes. So let me just start with that shortwave and longwave decomposition. Here's the figure that we've seen already with the total feedback in this second from bottom, total cloud feedback in the second from bottom row. And, and the partitioning of that cloud feedback into its shortwave 
and long wave contributions. And again, the PPE is in blue and we're comparing to CMIP6 models in yellow. And we can see that the spread is kind of maintained across this decomposition into short wave and long wave. And I'm sorry about the placement of this legend. It's covering a little bit of the spread here, but um, hopefully you can see uh, that that uh, that this that this kind of similar spread is maintained um, in this short wave and long wave decomposition. So now I'm going to move on to that a little bit more involved decomposition, where I de uh, decompose the total cloud feedback into its six um, assessed feedback components. Uh, those six components are, are the top six rows here, and the total cloud feedback is on the bottom here. There's a lot going on in this figure, so let me just walk you through it. Um, the PPE uh, is still in blue, so we have 206 blue dots here, and we can compare to what's going on in CMIP6 in yellow. And I've also included the AMIP um, models as well in green. Um, and for, just for reference, these orange lines um, are the assessed value uh, from Sherwood or the WCRP assessment that I showed two slides ago. Um, so when you're looking at this figure, uh, there are a number of, of things that you could look for. You could pick your favorite feedback. I know a lot of people are interested in the tropical anvil cloud feedback, and you could see how well the models are doing as compared to the assessment. Um, but the big picture that I think um, I take away when I look at this figure is that this spread in the PPE is coming from very similar processes as the spread across the CMIT model. So um, we can see that uh, in the decomposition here. There are some differences, right? There's a bigger spread in the um, high latitude, low cloud optical depth feedback. Um, and we can see that the PPE tends to want to give a high, uh, a larger high cloud altitude feedback, although the, the default simulation looks okay. Um, uh, so, so we still can't call this a coincidence, right? It still seems like this spread uh, coming from just perturbing parameters in one model um, is capturing the spread in the CMIP6 models, and that holds up, uh, broadly speaking, um, across processes. Okay, um, which parameters are setting the spread? I won't spend too much time on this. There's more detail about this in the forthcoming paper, um, but the three most important parameters are shown here, a microphysics parameter, a convection parameter, and a turbulence parameter. Um, and we have um, a measure of uh, uh, basically cloud error on the x-axis and then the total cloud feedback on the y-axis. Uh, there's, again, more detail about this in the paper, but this is just showing you, you know, we have 45 parameters that are, um, varying, these are the three that are most highly correlated with, um, uh, with the total cloud feedback. And I don't think that I have time probably to talk about this question. Um, I'll just give you the answer. You can um, ask me or read up about, about what I did. Um, so we saw that there's this very large spread um, in, uh, sorry, very large increase um, uh, in the ECS from CAMP5 to CAMP6, and that that's coming from cloud feedbacks. And we also saw a very large sensitivity of the cloud feedback to parameters. So is our changes in parameters uh, the reason for the increase from CAMP5 to CAMP6, or is it something else? And the answer is no. Uh, the, the punchline here is that there aren't there, there's not a very big difference between these two blue stars. Um, again, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go into detail, but no, um, uh, we can't. Uh, attribute the, the increase uh, in ECS from CAMP5 to CAMP6 to parameters, uh, meaning that's structural changes uh, that happened instead. So um, I think that's probably all the time that I have. Uh, so I'll just summarize here the two questions that I had the, that I spent the most time on are one and two. And so that was why is the cloud feedback um, lower in that PBE default simulation than CESM2? That, that was one of these kind of research turns, uh, an unexpected result. Um, but we found that that coupling and then changes from CAM 6.0 to CAM 6.3 were the two reasons for the lower cloud feedback. Um, and then we wanted to know about the spread. Uh, we wanted to know why we were able to, to reproduce the spread um, in the CMIP6 models by just varying parameters in one model um, and whether or not that was, excuse me, a coincidence. Um, and it seems like it's not um, given that uh, the processes setting the spreads are very similar across these ensembles. Um, uh, so let's see, I have a manuscript of this that I tried to upload to my website yesterday. So hopefully that's available. Otherwise you can um, email me. It hasn't been through peer review yet, but if you're interested in this, feel free uh, to take a look at that. Uh, send me an email. Um, yeah, thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Margaret. It's a fascinating talk. Interesting implications for parametry versus structural uncertainty. Uh, so you got a bunch of questions already. Um, Gavin is leading off with uh, a question whether um, the fixes highlighted by Zhu et al. Um, have already been included in 6.3. They have not. That's an interesting question. Um, so uh, let me see if I can pull up a figure for you. I I have, um, I'm sorry. Just one moment. I have a, a version of that figure um, that I just, uh, the kind of big figure uh, comparing the six components. I have a version of that figure um, where I've also include the um, the changes that Jiang Zhu made for the this kind of version of the PPE, which was calibrated um, to paleoclimate evidence. So that's that's what's going into that question. Um, and that cal those calibration those changes resulted in a lower cloud feedback, um, even lower than what we're seeing in our PPE. Um, and uh, those changes are not included. So so this difference is is separate. Um, from that. And I'm having a hard time pulling up the figure, so I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, but okay. you'll have to take my word for it. They're, they're not included. <laughs> okay. Um, Mark Zelinka asks, um, Margaret, it's interesting to me that CAM6 has a fairly strong negative high latitude, low cloud optical depth feedback. I thought Bjordal et al. showed that this model extratropical optical depth feedback was positive or at least eventually becomes positive. Okay, sorry, let me, let me get my slide back. Um, okay, sorry, could you just repeat the question for me? Uh, it's interesting that CAM6 has a fairly strong, negative, high latitude, low cloud optical depth feedback. I thought Bjorder yes. all showed that this model extratropical optical depth feedback was positive or at least becomes positive. Yes. Um I yeah, so I so so you're talking about you're talking about this dot here, I think, showing that this is on the high end, whereas I think we know um from Bjordal that the um there's this kind of like mean state effect um of of clouds um in uh in this particular model. I don't have a good answer for this. Um, that's one that's keeping me up, and I'm I'm sorry I don't have a good answer. Um, but but I I guess I share your question, um, and I I think you're right to be interested in that. So uh, let me let me keep going on that. So sorry about that, but yeah, very interesting question. Um, Gavin asks, how did you do the sampling in the forty five dimension parameter space? Yes, this is Latin hypercube sampling. Um, which basically uh, is a way of, of sampling randomly, but also ensuring that you are getting a, a relatively, you basically you basically sample randomly, but you kind of bin your, um, uh, you kind of set your parameter range, you break it up into bins and make sure that you're kind of sampling the whole range um, uh, and not kind of missing parts of, of, the, of the distribution. We have time for one more question. There's a bunch more in the chat that I invite you to address, and I'm going to pull organizers' privilege to highlight Torsten's question. Great work, Margaret. I have a philosophical question. Now that you have a model uh, on how you can tune ECS in the model, has NCAR given thought to how we will use this information in the future? This is a really good question, and, and I'm glad that you asked this because in the paper and, and here, I've intentionally kind of stopped short of recommending using this for model tuning. I actually, in my opinion, feel that it's very important not to tune the model to a particular ECS value that you want, but to rather um, uh, do, do the best you can and see what ECS you get. Um, that's my opinion about how models should be run and tuned. And so even though I think it's very interesting um, to look at the parametric sensitivity I'm I'm sort of I'm I'm not saying that we should necessarily tune based on this alone. Um, that we should use a larger body of evidence for our model tuning and not just try to pick the ECS value that we want. 
Okay, lots of interesting questions. So continue discussion in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you, Margaret. <clears throat> Our uh, last speaker for today is Paulo Tepe, a uh, lecturer in climate science at the Grantham Institute at Imperial College in London. Uh, Paulo, uh, take it away. Yep, hi everyone. Hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, just seeing my timer. So this is some work that's in progress. Uh, it's not published yet, so I'll be very interested in getting your comments. And uh, here are my collaborators. Um, and so I'll start with a bit of motivation. And it turns out we're all using the same motivation slide, so that will save me some time. But the point I want to make, as you mostly all know, I think, is that climate sensitivity has gone up from CMIP5 to CMIP6. And that's been shown to be mostly due to Short wave cloud feedbacks and some additional analysis in this paper by Mark that I also contributed to. Uh, we showed that it's mostly extratropical low cloud amount and scattering feedback um, or changes that contribute to the increase in, in cloud feedback. Um, so, um, what I'm using here for this study is this uh, cloud controlling factor analysis framework, which you may be familiar with, but if not, here's a bit of a summary. The idea is that we try and relate um, our cloud relative anomalies, which I'm calling DC here, um, at a certain point R, to uh, a set of cloud controlling factors, which are, uh, they're not physical processes per se, but we can think of them as being proxies for relevant processes. And so it's a, a physically motivated set of, of variables that we're using here. Um, and so we can relate the cloud relative anomalies DC to the partial derivatives um, with respect to each of these controlling factors x sub i times the anomaly in each controlling factor x sub i itself. And so I use the shorthand notation here. It's the linear combination of the cloud relative sensitivities and the anomalies in the controlling factors themselves. And so here, um, following up from a study that was published in 2021, I'm using ridge regression, which is like a, a refinement of multiple linear regression that also uses some statistical learning in it to optimize the regression coefficients. But the basic output from ridge regression is the same as what you'd get from multiple regression. So you get a set of partial derivatives re re relative to each of your um, uh, predictors. We can then use this approach to try and estimate cloud feedback. So I've just divided the same equation on the left by dt, which is the global temperature change. And so you get that the feedback can be approximated as the linear, linear combination of your sensitivity. So the theta, the theta terms here times uh, the changes in the controlling factors. And these are gonna come from uh, future global warming or not future, but, but say global warming simulations from four times CO2. Whereas the theta, so the sensitivities, are um, the components that we can try and constrain observationally uh, because we can calculate these from regressions based on historical data. And the idea is that most of the uncertainty is coming from, from these sensitivities here. Now, in this 2021 paper, uh, which is not the focus of the talk today, but just as an introduction, we found um, observational evidence of a positive cloud feedback. This is the net cloud feedback from all cloud types, globally averaged. And uh, we found that the observations were pointing to, the, let's say the best observational estimate was in close agreement with the CMIP uh, five and six model mean um, and pointing to a moderately positive cloud feedback. But one interesting finding in that paper, which was uh, kind of uh, a bit buried maybe in the supplementary material, uh, was that there was an interesting compensation of errors in the long wave and short wave components of the feedback. And so even though for the net feedback, it looked like the observations on the models were in close agreement, um, we actually found that for the long wave, the observations were pointing to less positive feedback. And for the short wave, the observations were pointing to higher or more positive values. And so in that paper, uh, we came up with this interpretation, which is the simplest interpretation you can make, I think, of these results. Uh, that this might be a bias in the high cloud amount feedback. So specifically, if your high cloud fractional cover or amount is decreasing more with warming in the real world than what the models simulate, then you would get a more positive short wave and a and less positive long wave feedback. But what I'm going to try and show today is that actually it might be more complicated than this and that this um, difference in short wave feedback might come from the low clouds actually instead of coming from the high clouds. So the data that I've been using for this study is um, mainly coming from MODIS, 
um, and these are low cloud radiative anomalies. If you're familiar, uh, I'm using cloud histograms and then combined with cloud radiative kernels. If you're not familiar, I'm happy to chat about this offline because I won't have time uh, to give details here. But so we have 20 years of uh, essentially low cloud radiative anomaly data. And we have similar data for ISKIP and Ceres, uh, which I won't be showing here for brevity, but qualitatively similar results. And then for the models, we can use satellite simulator data, which provides the same kind of formats, the same cloud histograms, which we can use to derive uh, low cloud radiative anomalies. Uh, here we use uh, 20 years between 1981 and 2000 from the historical simulations. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, I'm using ridge regression to calculate these sensitivities, the controlling factors, and I'm using six controlling factors shown here. Um, I won't go into details, but they're the same as used in previous uh, in previous studies. So um, kind of a standard set. And I'm focusing on the near global domain 60 south to 60 north, including both land and ocean. Right, so uh, I'll start by showing you some sensitivity maps. So these are effectively the partial uh, derivatives um, relative to each of the controlling factors. And so the left-hand column is showing the CMIP uh, mean results. So there's about 16 CMIP5 and CMIP6 models. I'm just showing the, the mean. Uh, the right-hand column is for MODIS. Uh, you've got uh, surface temperature, EIS, relative humidity, et cetera. Um, and they're in standard deviation anomaly. So what's per meter squared per sigma of each controlling factor? So that makes the comparison a little bit easier. Now, without discussing every detail, I uh, just want to say that, first of all, the results are, I would say, qualitatively similar to prior findings, particularly uh, the recent papers by Scott et al. and Myers et al. Uh, so, for example, the fact that we have a positive sensitivity to SSD of low cloud, uh, so a decreasing low cloud amount and therefore a positive cloud radiative anomaly uh, for increasing SSD. The opposite for EIS, uh, increasing stability means more low cloud. And the signs of the other controlling factors are also broadly consistent. We also have qualitative agreement between observations and GCMs. Now, I've put some emphasis on the qualitative term here. Um, and in fact, if you look more closely, I mean, so the qualitative agreement is in terms of the broad patterns and, and signs. But if you look closely, you can see that in particular for SST and EIS, you've got uh, differences in magnitude and you've got uh, quite substantially stronger sensitivity uh, in observations for SSD and for EIS, especially in uh, what we would identify as subsidence regions like the East Pacific or off Namibia, off uh, the Canary Islands, near the Canary Islands, so the, the, the Eastern Ocean basins where we have um, tropical subsidence. And so that turns out to be important for then the estimate of low cloud feedback based on the observational constraint. So first of all, what I'm showing here are global maps of the net low cloud feedback. So the top row is the actual feedback diagnosed from four times CO2. So it's what models actually simulate when you increase CO2. Uh, the second row is what's predicted from the historical sensitivities. So again, it's uh, coming from um, the um, the the sensitivity, the partial derivatives estimated from historical data times the future uh, controlling factor changes uh, based on this equation again. So we're using the historical simulations to see if we can predict the, the future feedback in model world. And I would say the answer is yes, we get a, a close agreement in terms of the pattern and the magnitudes. And then if we instead use the observed uh, theta, so the observed partial derivatives uh, based on satellite observations, then we find a similar uh, spatial pattern, but you can see that the feedback is much more positive. And so this is showing that the observations are pointing to substantially more positive low cloud feedback. And this is again, especially the case in the tropical subsidence regions. And this agrees with uh, the paper by Tim Myers and colleagues, but there are some differences relative to their findings, which I'll highlight in the next few slides. Uh, one difference is that we find a, a substantially more positive uh, feedback given the global mean. So I'll explain why that is in the next few slides. So first of all, um, before I go into that, we can look at the global feedback um, to get global values. And so this is now the net low cloud feedback for each model. So each circle is a different CMIP uh, five or six model. Um, so on the x-axis, you have the values predicted from the historical sensitivities. Uh, the y-axis is the actual feedback. And you can see that you can predict the feedback pretty well on a model by model basis. 
uh, because the dots are fairly close to the one-to-one -one line. So this is kind of a test of the uh, predictive power of the method. And then we can look at the observations. So the, the, the blue PDFs are showing the constraint that's inferred from observations. And that's, again, on the high side of the climate models. And so in this representation here on the right-hand side, you can see that the observed constraint is um, kind of uh, almost double what we, find, what we find from the GCM, so close to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 watts per meter squared per K. Um, and this is, as expected, mostly coming from the shortwave term. Uh, so low cloud feedback is mostly shortwave. You have a small a long wave contribution, uh, which is a bit more negative in the observations than in the models. You can also see that there are some differences between the observational data sets as well. Okay, so coming to this discrepancy then between the um, observations and the GCMs, it's actually quite insightful if you look at the breakdown of the net feedback into the um, contributions due to cloud amount changes. So that's the second column and then versus the optical depth changes, the third column. So essentially saying how much of the feedback is due to a, a, re a reduction or a change in the fractional cover versus um, a change in the optical thickness of the clouds, but without any change in fractional cover. And what you see here is that most of the difference uh, between the observations and the GCMs. So again, the observations are the bottom row. Uh, most of the difference between observations and GCMs comes from this optical depth component, which um, reinforces the uh, change due to cloud amount. So in those regions where you have a cloud amount decrease and therefore a positive feedback, you find an accompanying um, decrease in cloud optical depth, which reinforces that positive radiative anomaly. And you don't see that in the GCMs at all, in the, in the GCM mean at, at least. So that's intriguing. Um, and so if we look at the global values for each of those contributions, so the cloud amount here on the left-hand side and the optical depth on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, the optical depth term explains a lot of this discrepancy between models and observations. So more than half, there is some difference in the cloud amount uh, contribution as well, but I would say the observations are not as extreme in that regard. Uh, they're still fairly close to the multimodal mean, whereas they're kind of almost outside the GCM distribution in terms of the optical depth um, component. So um, I think I went, yeah, I'm just in time for the conclusions. Um, so to summarize, I'm finding that observations point to moderately positive low cloud feedback, and this is substantially stronger than GCMs. Um, and the main reason for this discrepancy seems to be that the GCMs are missing a positive low cloud optical depth contribution. Uh, so I found this quite surprising, and I'm curious as to whether we have uh, supported evidence from process models like LES simulations. Uh, I'm not an LES person, but if anyone here knows, uh, I'd be very happy uh, to know. Um, and um, now in terms of the implications for the GCMs, I think it's interesting coming back to the motivation slide uh, in terms of the change in ECS between CMIP5 and CMIP6. We've we've tended, to, or there's been a number of papers tending to say that probably these high GCM models are just unrealistic. Uh, but these results here maybe suggest that perhaps these high ECS models are not that wrong after all, at least in terms of the low cloud processes. But at the same time, we need to check for possible biases in other cloud contributions. And for example, the high cloud. So we still have this unresolved discrepancy here uh, in the high cloud, uh, the long wave feedback, which would oppose this more positive low cloud contribution. OK, so I'll leave it there. And I'm very happy to take questions. And thanks for listening. Thanks, Paolo. Very provocative talk. I loved it. Um, OK, questions. So let's see, Ross, really interesting, Paolo. Do you have any idea whether the optical depth differences are due to liquid water path uh, or effective radius or both? Uh, I don't, and that's an excellent question. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, it might be possible to check that with separate data because we have liquid water path data, for example, for the models. So yeah, that's a very good idea. Thanks for suggesting it. Cool, uh, Andrew. Very cool stuff. If cloud feedbacks are stronger over the low cloud subsidence regions than models predict, does that mean we should be less trusting of the SST warming patterns predicted by coupled models under abrupt four times CO2, i.e. fairly uniform warming, El Nino-like warming? 
Um, yeah, great question. Uh, so I, I have um, plans to investigate this. Uh, I'm quite interested in the idea of a possible coupling between the low cloud or generally the cloud feedback and the SSD pattern. And so um, a postdoc in my group, Philip uh, Broyle, is testing this. So we're, we're, we're while well, starting to test this, we're running um, CSM with uh, modified cloud feedback and seeing how the coupled response depends on that. So uh, hopefully we'll have an update on that in a few months or yeah. Cool, looking forward. Uh, Joel Norris, it's kind of tricky to distinguish cloud fraction changes from optical thickness changes in observations because it depends on whether optically thin slash partial cloud covered pixels are counted or not. Less of a question, more of a comment, I guess. Yeah, no, that's useful. Uh, and thanks for pointing that out. I think for MODIS, if I'm not mistaken, um, there, there are separate values. You can separately treat the partial uh, you know, the partially covered uh, pixels as opposed to the fully cloudy ones. So it might be worth uh, repeating or, or testing the sensitivity of the results, whether, you know, depending on whether you include those points or not. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Isaac. Isaac held. Uh, Paolo. It is impressive how the model's historical sensitivities reproduce the force response. Are these sensitivities just from high frequencies? Do they include El Nino? Right. Um, so I would say they do include El Nino, probably. So we, what we do is we subtract the monthly climatology. Uh, so we're looking at uh, deviations from the monthly climatology, and El Nino is bound to be part of that. Yeah. So it will be interesting to know how much of the signal we're getting comes from El Nino versus other things. And I don't have a good intuition for that. Um, yeah, maybe it could be tested by sort of regressing out um, an El Nino linked component um, and then seeing how much predictive power is left once you've removed that contribution. But yeah, good question. Uh, Dennis. Um, Dennis Hartman. Paolo, great work. Joel Norris asked my question. Cloud fraction is a concept dependent on a threshold. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Also more of a comment. Um, see, Rodrigo Caballero. Nice talk, Paolo. What time averaging do you use for the CCF analysis? Is there a sensitivity to that, i.e. monthly versus daily? Yeah, sorry that I wasn't very uh, precise in the slides. I went a bit quickly, but uh, yeah, so it's monthly data. We use um, monthly anomalies from monthly climatology. Uh, it would be interesting to look at daily data. Um, I think we're focusing on monthly partly because, you know, following what others have done previously and partly for practical reasons, uh, more model output available, easier to handle. Um, I guess if you go to daily, my, my, my intuition would be that you have, on, on the one hand, more signal to work with, but on the other hand, also more statistical noise. So I'm not really sure um, how the results would come out. It's possible that something intermediate, you know, pen tabs or, or some other averaging unit would work best. Uh, some, someone should look into that, but I haven't tried. Hey. Uh... I think oh, one more question, which we got just time for. Um, Yuan Jin Lin, uh, Jen is asking, is the overall base state optical depth different in observations, different from model historical simulations? Um, and if so, would that contribute to DRDX biases? Um, let's see, different in observations from models historical so is the idea that there might be a mean state dependence is that the question um i think that's what the question is pointing to um yeah i don't have a good answer to that i mean there is some evidence of um the optical depth feedback being state dependent but that's coming mostly from mixed phase clouds where we have a good reason to expect phase dependence, uh, state dependence, sorry, because, you know, the ice melts and eventually you run out of ice to melt. Um, but I don't know the answer for the, you know, tropical clouds that I've been focusing on here. Okay, um, we're at time. So I want to thank everybody, both the speakers uh, and the audience for uh, another great event. And 
yeah, round of applause for the speakers and we'll see everybody in April, on April 17th. And I believe the speakers are Clara Desser, Jonah Block Johnson and Ian Eisenman for the April event. We'll send an announcement shortly. Um, Paolo, if you want to stick around for two minutes to answer the questions from Mark and Tianli, you're welcome to. Okay, so Mark's question is, um, some of the CGILS results did show low cloud thinning with GC, which GCMs may, fa may fail to capture due to their coarser vertical resolution. And Mark's link, Mark links to a paper on that. Yeah, thanks to Mark. I will make a copy of that link. Does the chat remain available after the, or do I need to copy it now quickly before it disappears forever? I well, believe I've the chat. <laughs> I've copied it. It's fine. Yeah, it's in my, um, yeah. Um, okay. And Tian Li says, Paolo, great work. What was the rationale behind the assumption that high ECS models are overestimating? Yeah, well, so I think that's debated, but there's been a few papers looking, for example, at uh, historical temperature trends, you know, during the emit period and uh, coming up with constraints, well, mostly on the TCR, but uh, based on that, but but there's also been some um, kind of pushback from other authors because the emit period was obviously quite unrealistic, or sorry, not unrealistic, was special, you know, in terms of the SST pattern and the pattern effect. Uh, so it may not be a valid constraint if the models are missing the observed SST pattern, the coupled models. Um, yeah, that, that's the main evidence I'm aware of. Uh, maybe others know, but uh, I think my, my, my impression was just from also from informal con conversations that most people seem to think it just, you know, it doesn't seem plausible that, that we have these, uh, like, uh, I think often I get the impression that people are seeing this as something to fix in the climate models, right, rather than and it may be something to fix, but I think for now we can't really tell. We need to investigate that further. Uh, and one last comment from Larry. Dennis, the reported optical depth by MODIS is dependent on the cloud detection threshold and other quality control factors that reduce the representation of the data. Thanks. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, thanks, everybody. See you in about three weeks. Bye, guys. Thank you.